Hey, I'm Scott. And I'm Chris. And this is Doxologic, where we help you think with your Bible. Let's jump right in. The first question reads like this. Is surrogacy biblical, or should those unable to have their own children adopt instead? Hmm. Surrogacy. Surrogacy. So we're talking um, carrying another person's baby, yes. correct? Surrogacy. Yep. Is surrogacy biblical? Yes. Is the question. Mm-hmm. Or should you look to a, a, a adoption? Mm-hmm. Do, can we, uh, just maybe because I don't know, I don't want to presume more than I know, this is a phenomenally modern reality, right? Yes. Being able to even have this conversation sure. is because of the development of medicine and technology and sure right so so is it biblical right, I was not like tease that out. not as in in a bible verse that would support or deny it because right. it was not only not a thing so far from being a thing right until maybe the last generation maybe more of, of like of a, history yeah maybe it's more of like a like a moral obligation like if you can't have your own children but you desire to have children um, should you adopt rather than going through a surrogacy process okay which would be some uh Someone else, there's agencies for those, or maybe it's someone you know, yeah. uh, carrying a, basically a fertilized egg, of, but your... Your stuff. Your stuff. And someone else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, first thing I would say is that that's not a biblical reality because the Bible was written far before surrogacy was a reality. Um, I think right. there's wisdom principles, and I think the question is probably more appropriately, appropriately um, asked as, is it is it ungodly? Is it a not okay? To go that route, is it immoral uh, to go that route? I mean, and and it doesn't tie into IVF and those kind of treatments that that people have now. It's just specifically surrogacy. So, you know, we can address address that specific issue. Um, What I would say about adoption in general is if God gives you a heart and an opportunity, pursue it. I mean, I think adoption's right. a great opportunity. I think it's a great uh, blessing. I think it's a great picture of what God had in Christ has done for us. Right. And so I, I would just want our hearts, if, if the Lord tends to lead us in a direction where it's like, man, we, we're not able to have kids, I'm not weighing into the morality of surrogacy as saying, oh, that's bad necessarily. But if the idea is I'm, I'm on the fence and I'm not sure which way to go, I'm thinking adoption is a sure. great, great blessing from the Lord. I get the idea that there's something special about seeing what your wife uh, and husband, the DNA, when it comes together and has a baby and you can see parts of you in those kids, right. that's a very special reality. Yeah. I get that. Um, but adoption is a very special um, privilege and opportunity that any Christian who is able to engage in adoption and adopt a son or daughter is truly doing something blessed, you know? Mm-hmm. So I guess I'd want to start on the adoption side first before yeah. we even weigh into the surrogacy aspect. Yeah, and in surrogacy, it's not like guaranteed that whomever your surrogate is would become pregnant and like guarantee yeah. that they would be actually be carrying your child. Where I feel like you could also make an argument like just because you are applying for adoption doesn't mean that you'll be selected yeah. to be an adoptive parent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I don't know the stats on surrogacy, but I would imagine, like you said, it's not uh, entirely effective, and, and you are messing with an egg that's been fertilized and then transferred and transferred to the. Surrogate. Carrier, uh-huh. um, surrogate, yeah. and and so um, there's definitely some ethical realities in there that mm-hmm. you want to, you know, you don't want to be flimsy with a human life, you know, and if human life starts at conception, uh, and we're talking about what aspect does that play into um, engaging in the surrogacy process, I would say that would hem me in for sure. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to be flippant with human life as it in its even earliest inception forms in that transfer and all those kind of things. Yeah. And so it becomes a little bit complicated on that level for sure. I've, I've met with people various at various times re- regarding IVF, never about surrogacy specifically. But the, the general principle that I've always tried to give them is whatever you're going to do, can you do it by faith? Or are you doing it to control the destiny of my family sure. type of thing? So if it's going to be adoption, are you doing that because you really you're not trusting the Lord to provide for you through the natural means, or do you feel a calling to adoption? Mm-hmm. Then all day long, go the adoption route. Maybe surrogacy could fall into the same 
place of like, can you do it with an open hand before God? Or are you believing that you're creating a, um, an equ- almost like a mathematical equation mm. that this is the route that I control, that right. I get the child that I want, that right. God hasn't given me because he's not being good to me. Mm. So can you do it in faith? If you can't, then don't. It, it is sin. What, you, what you're doing that's not in faith is going to be ultimately sin. You're going to be controlling your life or it's it's distrust in the Lord. And so I think it falls um, in, in surrogacy, the conversation as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's helpful instruction. Mm-hmm. And sure. let your conscience lead you, right? Mm-hmm. Be informed by the word and let your conscience lead you. Understand what a human life is. Right. Understand the, 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 the risks that go into something like that and let it shape your decision making. But I don't think it's as black and white as, is it biblical? Uh, I, I think to, to what you said, Chris, that's a great framework to think through it. And I bet that's freeing to whoever asked that question. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Thanks, guys. All right. Next question. How are we as loving Christians supposed to respond to friends and neighbors casual mention of sins, especially those tolerated and promoted by culture? For example, if a friend or neighbor mentions their elementary son, age son has decided to become a girl or that their teenage daughter has a new girlfriend, does the response differ if we know they are Christian versus non-Christian? Well, we're not supposed to judge. Judge not, Matthew 7. Judge not, Matthew 7. The answer to everything, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Was that a joke? That's <laughs> yes, a joke. it's a joke. It's like, it wait is, a minute. <clears throat> it's, like... it's a joke because it conflicts with so many other passages <laughs> of Scripture. But right. we, we Christians love that passage, right? Uh, taken out of... You're not supposed to judge uh, the motive of the heart. You're not supposed to judge hypocritically. Uh, you need to judge introspectively before you judge others. Um, so there's definitely aspects that you, that yeah. hem in your judging, but you you best be sure there is a judgment that is supposed to come. Um, yeah. So I'm thinking First Corinthians five. Yep, same. Okay. Um, here already, and just the may, maybe the most important part to delineate for this person who wrote the question is the last part. Is that is is there a difference? I think is what it said. But yeah. Between... Does the response differ if we know they're Christian versus non-Christian? Yep. I, w- yep. I would yep. say yep. absolutely. Yep. Uh, so so. Our, on the general side, it's that you never take that lightly. Now, the two examples given are very concrete examples, which leads me to wonder if that's really like specific to their situation, because there's other things that people flippantly talk about as well. Sure. You know, like, uh, I don't know, cheating or lying on their taxes or something. And you're like, well, I don't really know if I'm going to do anything with that information. This is like life-changing realities in, in people's lives that you're neighbors with, right? So, can you speak up to the non-Christian about the truth, about God's Word, about God's good design for human sexuality, because both of those, I believe, were related to that? Yes, you right. can, but but the responsibility to do so does differ, I would say, with the Christian to the non-Christian. 1 Corinthians 5.12, Paul says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders, as in non-Christians, outside the church? Yeah, uh, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? And that's a question, but with a rhetorical affirmative. Is it not? It is those inside the church whom you are to judge. God judges those outside, purge the evil person from among you, he says. Yeah, and I would say the difference between the uh, responsibility of the Christian and the non-Christian is... God judges those. That's serious, right? God's judgment. And, and I think that's in an ultimate sense. Like you stay in your sin, you're going to be judged for that. And so we bring the unbeliever the gospel. And so you've got a beeline from the casual approach to sin to somehow God give me words, give me questions that allow us to confront this for what it is, for him to at least see that it's not in line with God's law, not in line with God's standard, created order, created order yeah. the goodness of how he designed things to be, and that walking casually in opposition to that is sinful. And if there's no grasp of sin, we, we've been talking about this in First Timothy, Jesus, this is a saying that's trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that so Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. So when they're casual about their sin, what what's the, I think what the struggles with the unbeliever is helping them see sin for what it is so you can point them to Jesus, right? We're always looking for gospel evan- evangelistic conversations versus the the believer who's walking in casual sin, you, you need to straight up, you know, have a, a conversation with that person. It may not, and here's the thing though, with your neighbor, and I want to be careful about this, like it may tiff, not be your responsibility right. because they go to a church, hopefully, right? They're involved in fellowship with other people. They're in Bible studies. They're under a local authority of 
of their elders and those kind of things. And hopefully those conversations are being had. Good shepherds and good leaders in the church are going to be able to address that. That may not be the neighbor's issue to address, but it would certainly be a concern. And so the first thing I would probably do is number one, as soon as I'm hearing that, I'm going, I'm committing this to prayer. I'm going to be for sure praying. And number two, I'm going to ask questions instead of start a, a just directly getting into the conversation. I'm going to ask questions about what they believe about this. What do they believe the Bible says? What, do you, what does your church say about this? If they go to, do you go to church? I'm going to be asking a lot of questions and do a bit mm -hmm. of inventory before, even though, yes, we are to judge the, the Christian, I want a lot more information in the form of question asking before I'm asserting anything. That's good. Yep. Yeah. So basically, and in both scenarios, a re an appropriate response would be just some good question asking. Yes. A witness to the non-believer and then just some more like inventory, like you said, for the Christian. Yeah, that's what I would. Yeah, that's how I would approach it. And I, I do think that the, the, the push toward, listen, assuming you're in a church, if, if they're not, you're in a quagmire of just like, what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. They're not right. underneath, which is a tragedy, but a common one, right? For right. Christians these days, maybe more than ever, but assuming they are, hey, listen, like you really should take this to your church. If you've got faithful pastors that you trust, you need to go ask, ask they're your spiritual authority in a mm -hmm. different way than I would ever be as your neighbor, mm -hmm. right? That's totally. good. Yeah. Or a question like, oh, have you talked to your pastor about that? Right. And then, you know, I'm sure a conversation would open up from there. Even. Yeah. 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 Cool. Thanks, guys. Uh, next question. Is it wrong for a Christian to use temporary or permanent birth control? Aren't we supposed to trust God's plan over ours? But what about when we feel we are maxed out? And I'm assuming maxed out means we got a lot of kids, guys. Ah. We're, we're done. Maxed or, well, out. She feels done. He feels yes. done. Whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Got okay. it. Which is different than, you know, um, a couple who's just gotten married and doesn't want to have kids right mm. away. Different scenario. Yep. Both are dealing with different birth control issues. Um, yeah. So let's navigate that a little bit. Do you want me to start there? Well, um, thinking to, to make the open disclaimer that Christians disagree on this. There are Christians that would say birth control of all forms should be not part of the Christian life. Yeah. Um, and, and ones that we respect. Um, but the difference also of what kind of birth control it is, right? Because there's a, there's birth controls and they can all be pills. So it's not just like the pill because there's right. so many varieties, but right. there, there are those that terminate life Correct. upon conception. Called abortifacients. Yes, yeah. thank you, versus, um, versus preventing it from taking place. Right. And we would... Overall, I believe, and I'll go first, and you know, uh, that's okay if you would sit, take a different stance and say that second option, which is a preventative from it even happening, can be done, um, particularly when it's being done in a manner to say, um, we believe the Lord would have us, whether it would be school that you're involved in, whether it would be certain realities of your life to say, we're, we're needing to wait, and we believe God would have us to wait. Mm -hmm. You can do that, though, as a controlling mechanism, and you want to watch your heart's um, purpose, right, yep. in, in why you're having uh, that conversation with your spouse. I agree. I would say, generally speaking, I stand in the same place. Abortive fashions, I'm out on, out, 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 and I don't want anything that gets even close to uh, uh, terminating a life in any way, shape, or form. So the kind of birth control that I'm going to enter into and, uh, and, and consider from a perspective of wisdom, that's out all the, already. Right. So I'm not, we're not going there. Um, but then when it comes to like the prevention, like you said, like, uh, I would be guessing vasectomy, uh, it'd be on the, well, that's we the are maxed more out, right. Uh, yeah. The more permanent part, options. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or, okay. So, but if that's the kind of stuff we're talking about, which obviously wouldn't be the same kind of birth control you'd be pursuing as a newly married couple. But, Correct. uh, nonetheless, you know, in that, I think, um, it's some of it is, um, Yes, procreation is part of uh, God's good design, but there's also a stewardship part to, to you know, handling everything that the Lord has entrusted to you. And um, you need to assess that. And I think to your earlier point, Chris, about doing it by faith, you need to assess, given your circumstances, you know, um, you know, the situation of your your lifestyle, job, all, all of those things are going to weigh into your capacities. You know, if you're if you're so heavily involved in ministry, it might affect what you can give to your kids, those kind of things that could mm. all be factors potentially. I'm not saying yeah. they necessarily are. I'm just trying to give scenarios into understanding like, wait a minute, as I consider my life as a steward and what God has entrusted to me, 
Um, yes, you can always do it by doubt. You can always do it by fear and go, no, this is too much. This is too much. And then close it off prematurely. But again, if you're seeking the Lord by faith, if you're wanting to do everything to glorify him, if you're open to Lord, whatever you have, but as we seek you and have confidence that this is a good stewardship for us, you know, I, I do think there it's within the realm of okay, to pursue certain forms of birth control when you are quote maxed out, which we are taking to mean we've got the we've got our quiver full, as mm-hmm. the, the book of Psalms would say, right? Yeah. Um, we have our quiver full, and uh, we're really grateful, and we want to be good stewards of those kids. We want to put in the you know the time that we can to invest in their lives, and each family is going to make a different. Um, you know, call that a different place, call that at a different amount of kids. And we really shouldn't, I don't think when you're in that realm, what we're talking about that you should cast judgment on others for their decision in that process. Some may never say that some may just go, we're going to keep it open forever. And it's going to be the easiest way for us in good conscience to say God's in control. Yes. And praise God to that, but let's not judge someone else who makes a different decision and goes, you know what, this is our stewardship. We're going to call it here. That's good. Super helpful. All right, moving on. As a new husband who enjoys reading a ton, how do I coincide that with guiding my wife better spiritually, who to this point doesn't share much of an interest in reading, researching, or diving deeper theologically? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know why it's funny to me. (laughs) We've seen this one a few times, uh, no doubt, in the life of the church here. It's an interesting... um, Dilemma is probably too strong, but it feels like it to the husband probably who who does love that. But I think that one uh, one place is to to start for me would be to watch uh, watch out for the moral equivalency of mm-hmm. how much you love to read with mm-hmm. how much she may not. Now I do yep. want to say that the word is being taken in foundationally, consistently by both husband and wife is not part of this conversation. It's the idea of the reading via research and doctrine and church history buff or love your reformational doctrines and you get all geeked out nerding into certain, you know, either creeds or 1689 versus Westminster, confessions, all the... All these things, I just want to watch out for the moral equivalency, husband, um, where your wife doesn't match that. Hmm. And and just to start there to say, um, you can desire more for her, but it may it's probably not needing to go the route of, it's a sin thing for her that she doesn't love it as much as I do. Yeah, and I'm thinking in my mind, don't repel her by hmm. your love for reading. So, by demanding she do it like right, you do. Right, right. Or, or, or by uh, not engaging in certain responsibilities, certain ways of serving the family, yeah. because you think you're doing the spiritual thing of reading. All right, reading is a blessing. I'm so glad this guy loves to read. Praise God. I hope the reading, though, is affecting his heart, right? All of our reading, all of our growth in theology should be developing character in us, should be developing humility, humility in us. And I go back to discipleship. Uh, deny yourself. Like one of the greatest things you could be showing your wife right now, depending on how reading, how does she view reading? Is she just not as into it as you, or does she a little bit put off by how much you're mm. reading? What it, what a sign it could be to her if you were to actually deny your reading in the hours, say, when the kids are awake, in the hours, say, when dishes are still needing to be done in the hours where the lawn still needs to be mowed and you're engaging in that and you're getting up early and finding other times to satisfy that very good and praise God for that interest and and desire to want to read, but you're not letting it come in between or substituting your Mm -hmm. responsibility, your family by this kind of spiritual facade of I'm a, I'm a reader. And what would that show your wife? If in your love for reading, which is a good thing, you deny yourself to serve her, to care for her. What, what if by doing that, it cultivates in her a desire to be more interested in what you love, you know, and then you slowly mm. build that together. And I would just say, don't control that, right? The Lord will, the Lord can build that. But the more important thing is not that you're a good reader. The more important thing is that you're a faithful husband, is that you're a lowercase s shepherd husband who cares for your 
bride. And I hope she senses that and knows that. And if you got to get up early before she gets up, because that's the time to read, that's the kind of discipline a godly man would have. Yeah. You don't give up reading, but you may sh- sh- uh, shift where you do it in your day. Yeah, that's good. I like what you said about like what we're reading, taking in should be like shaping us, maturing us, uh, growing us in those areas and kind of like letting your head knowledge like li- be lived out. And so I feel like that's what he's asking, like guiding my wife better spiritually. Yep. Um, and that's probably the exact answer he, he needed. Um, I feel like as a wife, I've gone through seasons of like, I don't care what you're reading right now, <laughs> like to, yeah, to right. Luther or right, right, right. Um, where it's like so in the weeds of something theological. I'm like, wow, uh, love it. Yeah. Love that for you. Uh, I want to hear what you're like, what, why is that exciting to you um, in the grand scheme of everything else in life? Like, why does that matter today? Or how does that change the way you're viewing God? Like, mm. I would care about those things. Yes. Uh, but the like, hey, how come you don't read as much as I do? Like, that's kind of hard. And I think it's, to your point, not as uncommon as you'd think um, yeah. between wife and husband. H- have, your, have your wife see that your love of reading is increasing your love for the Lord, yes. and it's transforming your leadership by s- serving, caring for, shepherding yep. her her heart, as opposed to like making it your goal and ambition to to increase her the, the amount of pages she's reading. Yep, and, yep, yeah. yeah. I remember in seminary one last thing they gave this kind of horror speech at the beginning about like um, the amount of guys uh, whose wives left them during seminary, wow. like it was that bad. They were so obsessed with their books, including a story that stands out to me of the gal taking all of his seminary books and stacking them up on her side of the bed with a note on the top that said essentially like I'm out of there. And I just remember going, oh my goodness, I can't believe this is a reality. And I was committed from that very moment on that if I knew the reading was a lot, I mean, you're reading a lot in Mm -hmm. seminary, but I was going to find a way that it wasn't going to, even if it meant sacrifice to me, that it wasn't going to affect Aaron in the same way. And I, I think by God's grace, she would say, for all the work you had to do, you seem to do it in times where it wasn't affecting us very much. And so, yeah, just being mindful of those kind of things because mm, it can go south. Mm-hmm. That's good. All right, last question. Does Doxa have a particular view of the millennium? We, we do on our doctrinal statement. What do we mean when we say millennium? Okay, uh, Y2K, right? Yeah, 1999. 2000. It's going to turn 2000. Year 2000. Do you have toilet paper stacked up in a uh, bunker? Canned food a, for yeah. six months. Canned food. Enough toilet Are you paper. okay living without electricity? Like, okay. We're not sure. <laughs> living without electricity, all that good stuff. For real. Yeah, no. So for real, we're talking about uh, what we believe about the reign of Christ. Um, J- Revelation chapter 20. Right. Um, Daniel chapter nine, you're going to get into some of that stuff as well. Um, this thousand year reign, how is that to be understood? Three major positions, premillennial, and there's two aspects of premillennialism, which means Christ would return before the millennium. Pre, before. Pre, before. Then there's ah millennium, uh, millennialism, which is no, ah, no millennium, uh, which is honestly kind of the sad brother of postmillennialism. There was really pre and postmillennialism originally, um, and not even to those kind of strength of positions. If you go back to the early church, they weren't as obsessed with the millennium as we are today. Right. It was really about uh, the physical, a uh, bodily return of Jesus Christ and the real physical resurrection of the dead, yeah. right? Uh, some to everlasting life and others to judgment, right? And that whole, uh, that's whole, whole reality. And so, um, so we do stay at a position where we, we stay at a premillennial position there. But I will say this, there are people on our staff who for good reason hold the, um, the awe and the post-millennial position. And there's good banter about this. This is one of the areas of um, theology that I would say is a third level or a tertiary level doctrine. So when I say first level, if you don't believe first level doctrines, you're not a Christian. Right. Second level doctrine is if you don't believe certain second level things, it probably means you go to a different church. Yeah, we're going to call each other brothers and sisters brothers, in the Lord, yes. but we're not going to fellowship at the same at church, the same serve church. at the same church. Exactly. There, there are meaningful, meaningful distinctions that would separate us. But you're a Christian, and right. we love each other, and we can um, we can partner in the gospel. Right. Yes, that's important. And then there is the tertiary issues, which is something like eschatology. Mm-hmm. 
And I think eschatology in our day is really built on the millennium. And that's why probably the question was asked. And we would say at Doxa, there is space to flesh that out here. There is space to have rich conversation, rich argumentation, a rich understanding of how to interpret certain texts. And it's not just Revelation 20. In fact, if, when you get into a, a, a developing of an eschatology, which I highly recommend, turns out it was very important to Jesus, there's a lot more in the parables that, than you think. There's a lot in understanding the Old Testament and the New Testament and the way the New Testament leverages the Old Testament. Anyway, so it's beyond the question, but it is to say this is a, a, a robust, we can have those conversations and fellowship within the same church together yeah. and push each other and hold each other to the text of scripture that uh, would defend whatever position seems to be the best. Um, and, and every position, because they are positions that have become more or less systems of how things are seen, right. have got legitimate, call it pushback or weaknesses, precisely because scriptures, the scriptures don't name a particular position. Right. And so we've, we, the we of church history, church leadership, the, the how, who knows how much ink has been spilled on this now, are doing our best to get to a most biblically faithful reading of what to expect in the end times or your eschatology, right? right. So those are the, the yes, they have millennium in, or millennial and then pre- Ah, and then post millennial that Christ will return after a, a very long period of time in which the world, uh, a la Matthew twenty eight, and go and make disciples of all the nations. The belief of the post millennial is the firm belief that the Matthew twenty eight Great Commission will be successful because God doesn't fail, and the Spirit will see that over time and a very long period of time, probably shockingly long period of time. If you're in a premillennial perspective, they would say we may have thousands of years left. Left at this because the Christianization of the world, not universalism, unless you get a wonky postmillennialism, which is unfaithful, but a Christianization of the nations by discipleship and gospel proclamation is where postmillennialism will say that's where we're headed. And so I mean, man, it's been a three-year journey for me. I, I can remember um, to my shame how many conversations I've been in when I've been a pastor in this church in the early years. As soon as someone wanted to bring this up, I was just looking for the exit signs of the conversation. How do I get out of this? Partly because I didn't understand the issues very well. Mm -hmm. I didn't even understand them well enough to poke at them from where they're coming from, and the, and it just fell on me. I remember talking to you probably in the middle of 2018, and, mm -hmm. and you, you helped point me to some of the best arguments biblically from each position. God those books multiple thousands of pages later just to say it's still a journey I'm on but mm. that I understand each position yes. better than I ever have right and I'm now happy to have the conversation because mm. it is I would say the the most important thing uh, well that, that's probably saying too much but a very important thing is that we are optimistic of Christ's reign and ultimate reign rule and victory how he's going to flesh that out. We can have that conversation. It should be a banter conversation, not a, you know, argumentative one per se, sure. but that he will, he is reigning and he will reign victorious so that we have a momentum as opposed to a defeatist mentality. Right. Some Christians have a defeatist mentality. It's all getting worse. It's only going to get worse. And so why don't I hide in my house and not live for the mission of God's kingdom? Hmm. And I would say just on a fundamental level, that's where we, we can't accept that that defeatism in the gospel if we have the Holy Spirit. Right, inconsistent. With I know we're going well beyond the millennium right now, but the, the historic premillennial position is right. the... That's on the page of that's on the, page the of, website, of the right? Website. And that, that's an important and valuable position to learn if you don't know it. But um, but it is it's it's a joy to be at a church where that's not something that takes such center stage that we're divided over it. Yeah. Super helpful, guys. Thanks so much. Well, that concludes this mailbag episode. Thanks, guys, for listening, and we'll see you next time. You've been listening to Doxa Logic, a podcast by Doxa Church in Rockland, California. To learn more, visit doxachurch.net.